Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is my, I think this is my 101st consecutive weekly economic outlook, a sort of brief tour d'horizon of what seems to me to be the most important issues as far as the global economy is concerned. This week, as last, it comes from the end of Long Island, though I'm not sure that that gives me any special insight into anything perhaps with the uh, exception of a sense of growing disillusionment amongst American Democrats with the Biden presidency. I, I even heard one embittered Trump hater say that, in his opinion, the only Democratic ticket that could win in 2024 would be Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. The only response to that, I think, is ho-ho. Obviously, in the real world, um, one can't ignore the Russian-Ukrainian war, which is now in, I think, its sixth week, and it's going nowhere, though I suppose one can hope that the visit of the Austrian Chancellor to, to Moscow today, uh, one might conceivably produce a breakthrough. More likely, however, I fear Herr Dr. Nihima uh, would just prefer a bilateral deal on energy. After all, Austria is even more dependent on Russian oil and gas than is Germany. Whatever, I think it is as well to remember that Ukraine isn't the only geopolitical game in town. Uh, and in particular, I find it I find it actually really rather scary how quiet the news has gone on the Vienna talks about renewing the joint plan of action on uh, Iran's nuclear program. After all, we've heard for months uh, that Tehran is on the verge of producing a usable nuclear weapon. And then, of course, there's the uh, situation in nuclear armed Pakistan, though it does appear, at least for the moment, that Imran Khan is accepting his parliamentary defeat, though losing to the brother of his long-term adversary, Sharif uh, Nawaz Sharif, uh, must hurt him, particularly if he really does believe that the confidence vote in the parliament was prompted by dollops of American money. Still, there's no doubt that Ukraine is the biggest threat, both uh, militarily and economically. And as General Milley, chairman of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff, predicted last week, the conflict could go on, and I quote, for years, particularly if we in the West continue to trickle feed advanced weaponry to the Ukrainian forces. In my opinion, there are too many people, particularly in Washington, who believe that it is in, in the US interest to keep the war going in the hope of bleeding the Russian economy to death. Unfortunately, it's not just the Russians who will be hurt. Obviously, the Ukrainians are hurting even more, as are the more than 50 countries, according to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, that are dependent on wheat and edible oil imports from Russia and the Ukraine. Many of them are in the MENA, Middle East and North Africa region, where things are pretty tough uh, already and where the street has a history of periodic eruptions. As a result, I worry about Tunisia and Morocco and Egypt and Yemen and Lebanon rather more, for instance, than I worry about Germany and Austria and Italy and the Netherlands, even though I gather that all of them are at least considering rationing natural gas. But everywhere has been hit. Global food prices were up. 34% year on year in March, or by 12.6% month on month. That is virtually unprecedented. And I can't see that things are going to get any better anytime soon. Certainly, Ukrainian farmers aren't going to be planting crops. And the US squeeze on the global payment system is making it very hard indeed for long term importers of Russian grains to pay either in hard currency or even in rubles. 
I banged on for we, at least the last few weeks uh, about the collateral damage being done by the sanctions regime that the US is imposing. Now, I understand the rationale for that. And of course, economic warfare is far, far better than conventional warfare, but it is a dangerously blunt tool. And I want to flag two issues that I feel have not yet really got the attention that they deserve. The first, is that I believe there's a pretty strong case to be made that sanctions will accelerate the decline of the US dollar as the world's hegemonic currency. Uh, Barry Eichengreen, a well-known American economist in California, has been banging on for some time about the, quote, stealth erosion of dollar dominance, as reflected, for instance, in the declining share of foreign exchange reserves denominated in dollars from over 70% to about 51% at the last count. Um, and also by the weaponization of the dollar by the US authorities, in particular, the freezing of dollar assets held abroad. I think that that is bound to accelerate in the future, and it's bound to accelerate the drift away from dollar hegemony. The, quote, exorbitant privilege of printing the world's preferred currency may, may be becoming a thing of the past, and perhaps within a shorter time frame than Washington policymakers will feel comfortable with. True, the euro and the renminbi, the Chinese renminbi, are poor substitutes, as is, the, the, as is gold. But as the crypto bros who were meeting last week at the Bitcoin convention in Miami made very clear, there are synthetic alternatives. One doesn't have to go as far as Peter Thiel, who called Warren Buffett, who was speaking at the, the convention and called Waffin, Warren Buffett a sociopathic grandpa, uh, to see that uh, cryptos do have a role and could play a growing role in, alter in official reserves as an alternative to the dollar. The second issue that concerns me is what the exclusion of more and more Russian banks now including Spare Bank and, I, and Alpha Bank, from the SWIFT network means. It certainly makes international payments more difficult, more time-consuming, and more expensive, uh, all of which will have a big impact on global inflation. But it, is also, it has also given, I think, an enormous boost to China's payments alternative, the CIPS system, uh, which apparently now has about 1,200 members in more than 100 countries. Beyond that, I think it's also given a big boost to bilateral clearing arrangements, such as we used to have in the 1970s, I actually remember them. Ironically, at that time, most of them were involved with Russia and with the Comic-Con countries. Now, we learn that Russia has its own bilateral clearing arrangement with India, another one with China, and indeed one with Turkey. They're inefficient, they're costly, but needs must. I think we'll see more of them. All of this pretty much ensures that the very slick engine of global commerce, which has been developed over the last 20 or 30 years, is going to be sputtering. And that means higher, indeed even higher, inflation and a greater risk uh, of the global economy falling into recession. Let's take the, the risk of recession first, not, not least because last week, Jamie Dimon, remember him? Uh, JP Morgan's Jamie Dimon became the latest Wall Street superstar to warn about the precariousness of the global, e of the global economy. Now, personally, I'm still uh, agnostic on this. I, I certainly don't agree with those who argue that central banks should hold off on withdrawing stimulus for fear of tipping the global economy into recession. And, and, and I will point to the latest S&P Global PMIs, the Purchasing Managers Indices, as evidence that growth is turning out to be a good bit more resilient than many, perhaps most, perhaps including me, had expected. The composite PMIs, which were released last week uh, for all the major economies, um, show that only China came in under 50 last month, which is the cutoff between positive and negative growth. Elsewhere, 
The US PMI, for instance, rose from 55.9 to 57.7. Japan's PMI rose from 45.8 to 50.3. And the UK's PMI rose from 59.9 to a pretty hefty 60.9. Now, China is obviously a special case. Last week, the World Bank cut its GDP forecast for China this year from 5.4% to 5.0%. But more important, it warned that the figure, the actual turnout, could be as low as 4%. And even that, I think, may be on the high side if the government in Beijing persists with its quixotic zero COVID strategy. Over the weekend, Speaking of zero COVID, there were reports of food riots in Shanghai. Uh, there were also reports that there are 150,000 COVID cases in Shanghai, which justifies the, uh, the lockdown, but that there have been zero, zero deaths and only one serious case. I think that the situation in Shanghai will ensure that uh, next month's Party Congress, the first in five years, will not be the smooth coronation that Xi Jinping had hoped for. I'm sure that he'll still get the third term as president that he wants, but there are going to be a few, what can I say, raised eyebrows within the CCP, the Communist Party hierarchy. In just a few months, China has swung from an apparently irresistible economic juggernaut to something that is starting to look like the sick man of Asia. The other outlier, as far as the PMIs is concerned and the risk of recession is concerned, is Europe, or at least the Eurozone. It was reported uh, last week that in Germany, the composite PMI fell last week, last month, from 55.6 to 55.1%. However, frankly, I, I don't find that particularly worrying, at least, at least not yet, though I guess the squeeze on supply chains, on energy, and, and perhaps on consumer confidence could turn things around. On that score, I admit that other economic releases in Europe last week were less than wonderful, in Germany in particular. In Germany, for instance, it was reported last week that factory uh, orders, factory orders were down 2.2% in February and that industrial production was off 0.2%. On the other hand, however, both exports and imports were up sharply, which does suggest that there's demand somewhere in Europe for German goods. As for France, where I note that pretty much the whole of the media uh, who were trying to big up Marine Le Pen as a serious threat to Macron in Sunday's elections were, as I predicted, proven wrong. The, the economic news in France wasn't great, with industrial production off 0.9% in February and retail sales down 06 So I suppose one can worry a little bit about France. But this is far from a recession. And I don't know how long the ECB, the European Central Bank, which meets this week, is going to put off joining the Fed and the Bank of England in raising Eurozone interest rates. The markets don't expect the bank to move this week, presumably using the uncertainties over Ukraine as another excuse for inaction. But all the while, inflation is moving steadily towards double digit rates. The bank certainly ought to move, in my opinion, and like the Fed, it ought to move in half-point steps, perhaps, rather than 25 basis point steps. Last week was actually as far a pretty thin one as far as hard data on inflation was concerned. I think this week is going to be an awful lot more important. There's a huge amount of inflation data coming out. And, and, and indeed, we've already had this morning data from China. But still, last week, it was reported that Eurozone producer prices, the PPI in the Eurozone, was up 31.4% year on year in February. And Closer to home in the UK, it was reported that house prices were up another 1.4% in March. For what it's worth, it was also reported that the CPI, the Consumer Price Index in Russia, 
accelerated last month from 9.22% to 16.7%, which is a huge jump for one month, though whether one can believe this or not, I haven't got a clue. Of course, a major factor in the recent rise of prices has been the energy price, and I guess we can expect some relief on that. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, there's been a pretty sharp fall in crude oil, oil prices. Brent, for instance, one of the key market crudes, is down around 13% over the last two weeks and was trading on Friday at about 102 bucks a barrel. Um, Witty, the other major market crude, was also off 13, 13% and was trading around $98, just below the crucial $100 level. So is the energy panic over? Well, I, I think the short answer to that is, is, is probably no. The drop in the oil price mostly reflects the decision by the United States to release 180 million barrels from its strategic petroleum reserves at the rate of 1 million barrel a day and also a broader commitment which was announced last week by the rest of the IEA membership, that's the International Energy Agency membership, to add to this draw another 60 million barrels. Uh, the problem is that with global oil consumption, around 98 or 100 million barrels a day, this is little more than 1% of global demand, and I don't think that's going to have much longer term impact. Ironically, however, one of the other factors that just might be driving oil prices down from their recent highs, and that might keep them there for a little while, is that despite heavy pressure from the United States, there are still plenty of customers for Russian oil, admittedly at some very hefty discounts. The finger is being pointed in particular at India but several Asian and African countries are continuing to buy, indeed are boosting their own strategic reserves, South Africa being one of them. In the meantime, I noticed that uh, our own Boris Johnson launched a new UK energy plan last week that, for the moment at least, circumvents our legally binding commitments to meeting the Paris Accord targets. This plan is based on, first of all, tripling uh, Britain's nuclear power capacity by 2050, presumably largely on the basis of small modular reactors, since mega projects these days in the nuclear area are almost impossible to finance. Further development of offshore wind, fine, good, and a renewed focus on, a renewed and long overdue focus on North Sea oil and gas, good, says I. But but I also, from a safe distance, watch the eco-zealots in the UK at work trying to bring London, for instance, to a halt. And I wonder whether common sense can really trump ideology, particularly when our ideologically driven commitments are, on climate change are actually enshrined in law, which was a mistake that most other countries, by and large, did not make. As for this week, well, I guess we will be digesting what the result of yesterday's French presidential election means and what will happen in the April 24 runoff. I note, as I think I've mentioned, that as usual, Macron's clack at the Financial Times and at the New York Times as well are bigging up the threat that uh, Marine Le Pen uh, will pose. Um, but the sad fact is that she poses no threat at all. Indeed, she came close to losing. The big, this is the big story. The, the big story is that she came close to losing the runner-up slot to Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who got around 21% of the vote, 22% of the vote to her 23.4%. There isn't a single Mélenchon voter who will shift to Le Pen in the runoff, whatever they feel about Macron. Many will sit on their hands, but at least half will vote and they will hold their noses and vote for the president. He may be perceived of as the president of the rich, but he's He's not Le Pen, and the campaign to, to vilify her as a nasty, xenophobic, anti-Semitic racist in the mainstream media uh, means that no one to the left of Macron will vote for her. 
Other than that, the focus this week is likely to be on inflation and what the ECB Council does or says about it. Markets will focus in particular on the US CPI and particularly on the core CPI uh, for March. It will also focus on the harmonized CPI data for the Eurozone uh, and for Germany in particular. And as far as UK inflation is concerned, it will focus on the CPI, the RPI, and the PPI, a powerful trifecta. As I noted, China's inflation data for March came out this morning, and it was uh, a little higher than expected. The CPI was only 1.5%, but the PPI was 8%, and that has worried people a little bit. Beyond that, watch for the economic sentiment data for the Eurozone. That should give us a better sense of just how realistic fears of imminent recession are. My guess is that they're not quite as... Uh, realistic or as imminent as it appeared only a couple of weeks ago. See you next week, I hope, possibly on Tuesday rather than on Monday, from the leafy English countryside. Uh, that is if Extinction Rebellion will let me get there. Thanks for watching.